So we are recording now. This is meeting 24 of the Closure Visual Tools group. And today we'll have Adam talking about bad spreadsheets. And maybe at the end, we'll have a discussion of broader context of HTMX. Thank you everybody for joining. And we will begin with Adam's presentation. And Adam, maybe you'd like to say some more about yourself for the public part. And um, let us begin. Well, hello. Uh, thank you, Daniel, for inviting me to this meeting. I'm pretty excited to talk about my project, Bad Spreadsheet. Um, as mentioned, I'm Adam. I uh, work at Metabase right now as a closure developer. Um, my uh, quick background, I studied mechanical engineering in undergrad. I didn't study computer science or programming or anything like that. So it was a bit of a journey to learning closure, but I am approximately self-taught, you know, as, as self-taught as one can be when you end up working with excellent developers. Um, but a lot of my motivation in general for learning programming was around using my computer to help me uh, make designs and make things. I I like, you know, welding and woodwork and, and all kinds of creative visual projects and stuff. And so I feel like a computer is a pretty powerful tool to aid in the design of those sorts of things. Um, but before I knew how to do much programming, I found it a little bit frustrating, you know, if, if a design tool didn't quite do exactly what you wanted. And I figured, you know, if I can learn to program, I can kind of unlock this power of the computer and um, start using it as a more powerful tool. And that has been kind of a motivating through line in a lot of my um, pursuits and little side projects here and there. And that's currently culminated in this bad spreadsheet project, which is a uh, visual 2D uh, canvas spreadsheet tool for visual design work. Um, the name bad spreadsheet is a little tongue in cheek. It's, it's, it's basically just to uh, take the pressure off myself. You know, it's a side project. I want to make something really cool, uh, but it's an iterative process and I don't want it to, I don't want to get bogged down in necessarily making it perfect right away. I'd rather have something kind of bad that works and then, you know, shave off the rough edges as I go. And uh, funny enough, it's sort of at a point where it's, I, it's very far from perfect, but it's, I think, uh, very exciting and cool that people are a little bit interested in uh, seeing what the state of it is and um, being here to ask questions and and talk about the spreadsheet. So I'm I'm just very excited about all that. Um, yeah, that's that's me. Um, any questions so far? Uh, if not, I'd I'd like to share the screen and I can get into um, actually working with the spreadsheet a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and share the screen. And uh, yeah, people can ask in chat, I guess, or just chime in and interrupt at any point. I'm totally happy to answer questions or to say I don't know <laughs> if I don't know the answer. All right, let's, uh, let's have a look here. Uh, can everyone see um, my browser window here? I, yes. I think it looks OK. Great. All right. so. Um, I'm, I'm going to start, I'll, I'll go over the details of the tool in a minute, but I wanted to kind of zoom in for a moment on roughly my guiding principles here. Um, it's a passion project of mine. Uh, I love to make things and I want the computer to be a powerful tool. I've kind of talked about that a little bit. Uh, here is a, an SVG quilt pattern that I've designed a while ago. Um, this is an example of some visual design stuff that I like to work on. Um, I work on this with my mom and I want to keep using bad spreadsheet to help make tools to make designs like this. That's just one example of uh, what I like to do here. I am. Um, I'm not going to obviously show this whole video, but I gave uh, a talk at the 2023 college where I do uh, 
kind of go over this sort of thing. And and here, um, just very briefly, I have another little prototype project that was almost sort of leading into the bad spreadsheet here. So if you're interested um, in scrubbing through that video later, there's some more detail about, um, you know, a, another design tool that I was working on that kind of became this. Uh, I also uh, have another um, video showing a different tool I made where uh, you can do some free modeling in the browser with, it also has HTMX in it. And this is an example of another little project that I'm uh, hoping to kind of incorporate into the spreadsheet today. And, you know, since it's not loading, that's, that's fine. We'll move on from that. <laughs> not a big deal. Um, uh, this, this is another solenoid example. That's the name of this prototype project I was working on. Oh, and um, let's not do that right now. I, I meant to move this to a different example, but uh, there was one question in the Clojure and Slack about, um, you know, how you might handle something like an API call that has a delayed response or something like that. Um, I've got just a quick example here. Uh, I aired up this, um, this sends a prompt to ChatGPT through the API, and then it um, gives the response there. So it's just, a, this was just a little side example to show like, you know, you can send off an API request and then you'll get the response and you can, uh, you can be on your merry way. Uh, let's do, uh, can you give me, uh, Closure function that adds two numbers, just to show that, like you know, it, it's actually doing. There we go. Add numbers. That's uh, and you know, while I'm while I'm doing this, let's just uh, make a new one here, and see if it works. There we go. So um, that that's that's just a nice little example of um. Being able to use um, non real time, like like asynchronous, there we go, that's the word, asynchronous um, elements in your spreadsheets. Uh, now, if you give me just a second, I'm going to uh, load up a different spreadsheet. One thing I haven't built perfectly yet is like a, an in app loading mechanism. Um, I've got um, I've got the ability to load things up here. Uh, in the REPL. So this this is um, obviously areas for improvement, but, you know, there we go. If I load that up, the basics, I can refresh this. And now I'd like to uh, show a little bit of the details of um, what's actually happening at, at a high level so that we can launch into some more examples and um, uh, kind of build up from there. So the basics of the spreadsheet tool. Uh, I've got a 2D canvas. You might have seen little bits and pieces here and there already. Um, with the uh, arrow keys, I'm moving this cursor. And I can hold Control and Shift to resize the cursor. Um, I can also click, double click to resize the cursor to a default size. I can click and drag. Um, and I can, you know, hover over these what I what I call cells to, you know, highlight those cells. When I've got a cell highlighted, I can resize it with the arrow keys. Um, a little feature I haven't added yet is obviously it's pretty intuitive to have um, drag resizing on the sides of rectangles. That's something I have to add yet. Uh, but I do have this um, drag. Uh, button here so it's partially implemented um you know there's work to do um so uh let's see here the results you know i'm i'm getting ahead of myself already uh the res okay sorry guys um inside any cell let me just create a new one if i press enter i'll create a new one that spawns a code editor inside the cursor, as you just saw. You can write whatever closure code you want in there. So two times three is six. 
And when you exit the code editor or you press Alt Enter, um, the front end will send a request to the back end. The string is redevelled and a couple little things happen and then it sends the value forward. So, you know, you saw that the value is right here. Um, so what I just did is to see the results, I flipped the cell, these arrows up and down, flipped through different display types, got note, just the value, a control type, which I'll show in a minute, none to turn it off, and then the content for editing. So uh, most relevant a lot of the time is content and value. Um, there's there's work I need to do uh, around the note display type, for example. This here is a note display type, and this is a value display type. So you can see there are differences, but in many cases, the note display type is irrelevant. But again, implementation details that aren't that important. Here's the code for that cell, by the way. It's a markdown note. It just parses it and shows it as markdown. Um, all of that's uh, kind of neat, but it's not super useful on its own. The real power comes into play when you can um, uh, when you can actually reference other cell values in different cells. And in order to do that, you can do you can use what I call I'm calling sharp forms in your code. So um, once you do that, then whatever cell you've referenced, its value becomes available in um, the cell you're using. The, I'll show it again in more detail in just a moment. Right here, this cell one value is being used inside this note. And if I go over cell one, which ID one here, um, new um, with, a new value. If I hit uh, Alt Enter, then you can see the new value shows up in here right away. Um, if I get rid of it, it cached the last value. That's not sad. That's happy. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so, you know, pretty basic, pretty simple. Um, that's what you do if you have a C sharp inside your code. Um, let me make it even more clear, let me just put it right here and I'll do C hash one. Um, that this form gets evaluated and the value gets placed right in there. Uh, let's see, the other useful um, hash or sharp form is um, the location reference form, L hash. And it takes a 2D coordinate as an argument. One thing I didn't point out, but um, maybe another area to improve. Uh, you can tell where you are in your sheet uh, by moving the cursor over and seeing. So this 4421 is the top left of the cursor and 4926 is the bottom right of the cursor. Um, since there's currently no under other indicators of location, it is a little harder to write a location cell, but uh, as a start, it's still pretty useful. Um, so let me show how that works a little here. Here, for example, is L hash 50 zero. It's currently sitting over cell two. If I move this, it's now um, not referencing anything. So the value isn't shown. And if I put it back, then it shows up again. And here I can put a different cell in its place and you get that different value. So with these forms alone, you can start to make a nice tree of cells and you can um, build out a lot of useful features from there. Uh, finally, I wanna just show, um, let's move, I'm gonna just delete these. I'm going to reuse cell four over here. And we're just going to look at cell six here as a reference. Uh, if I change this to the number 200, I can flip it and that's the value there. It, you know, it's pretty easy to just um, type new numbers in. But a lot of the time, if you have a number value that you want to change around, it's way nicer to have a number input, for example. 
So I flipped this cell over to its control uh, display. And now I have this number input and you can, you can see the values just reflected right away. So that's um, a pretty convenient thing to do. Um, let's see here. Let's see. Uh, can cells be moved programmatically? Uh, I did hack together a little bit of that. So in the back end, um, I've got like the sheets namespace and I have functions that can move cells around and you like they're public. So if there's time, maybe a little later, I can maybe do some live hackery and I can show you that. Yes, indeed, you can programmatically move cells around. Um, uh, I had an idea. I haven't done it yet, but since it's a nice 2D grid, and I actually, I didn't show this, but I also have, um, I've got some timer cells that I'm working on that um, tick up every N milliseconds. So T1000 is every second. Uh, using that and using some cell moving things, you could, you could start to make like little automatons or whatever, hop around your cells, but, uh, um, that's a, another little experiment for another day. Um, that happens to be the basics. Um, uh, I might, I, I hope that covers things decently. Please, uh, please go ahead and ask for clarifying questions. Um, I, the, you know, the other thing is I'm in this tool a lot. I know how it works. So if there's stuff that just doesn't make sense, please don't hesitate to ask uh, and go right ahead. Um, I'm going to load up the next example that I wanted to show, but uh, please ask in the chat or talk out loud while I load that. Um, uh, load that up. Awesome project. Uh, uh, my name is Adhem. I am a backend closure dev, also self taught. Uh, I'm experimenting with some HTMX stuff uh, myself too. And mm -hmm. for the sending of the cell value, the cell string, and read evaling that, are you using anything? special there like uh, like the small closure interpreter or are you just like read evaling and returning the result and if it's just the read eval are you doing that in like a particular namespace binding or like in what namespace is it executing uh great question um not using sci the eval the evaluation of all the forms happens on the back end so i'm using um regular eval um you know evals, evil, and all that stuff. That's another reason why this is still called bad spreadsheet. You know, it's at, <laughs> at this time, it's running on your own machine. You're running all the code. I, I just used eval. Um, what namespace is it in? That's actually something I have to um, still work out exactly. I thought when I implemented it that I was just evaling everything in the user namespace, but I've run into problems where um, I'll do some requires in the user namespace, but uh, they won't be found. And it turns out they're in closure in, in apparently the closure core namespace. So once I fix that, the basic idea is I start in the user namespace and I wanna build on a little system where maybe there's, you can imagine some kind of little drop down here that's like a top level requires and it's it's a special spreadsheet namespace or something like that. So as of right now, it's supposed to be user and due to user error, <laughs> it's not necessarily perfectly, um, it, 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 something's wrong. I have to fix that. But the point uh, is to be in user. <laughs> I see, I see. Yeah. The, the way I hacked around it is I'm using the, like the binding function and I'm yeah. binding the, like the namespace dynamic land and then running the eval inside that, uh, inside that block. So that's yeah. how I, yeah, like that's how I hacked it. So I was wondering how you, how you were hacking it. <laughs> yeah, so I, I've done the same thing and uh, assuming that that would work. And so it, it's very possible that I, um, excuse me, um, have just lost the plot a little bit on my own cell implementation. So in the back end, I've got now three different versions where I was playing around with how to implement the cells and the um, like dependencies on one another. And it is entirely possible that 
Um, <laughs> I just messed something up and haven't fixed it yet, to be completely honest. Uh, the point is, the intention at this time is that it evals in the user namespace. And the reason is, so you're not polluting other namespaces so that you can um, kind of load whatever you need into there and go from there. Um, but I don't want to troubleshoot live right now. That's that's too embarrassing for me. <laughs> um, yeah, let me let me load up another example, and uh, and we can keep keep chatting. Uh, let's see. So here, um, I showed a bit of this on Twitter the other day. Um, unfortunately, I did this on a screen where I had a little more real estate. So um, this, I'll zoom back in in just a minute. This is an example of the kind of um, design work that I was already doing just in a closure REPL and thought would be much nicer to be able to do with a more interactive element. So let me uh, clear things up. And I'll just show you really quickly the interactive part. And then I can start to explain a little bit of how I built this and what's happening. So here I have a drawing canvas. And down here, I have another drawing canvas. Right here is a, um, oh, sorry, everyone. That's not what I meant to do. Right here is um, some closure that just renders some SVG, but it's referencing some other cells that have dynamic changing content. So you'll see, you know, the SVG change as you make changes. And uh, let me do this. I've got a third canvas here that I'm drawing stuff in. And now you see up here another SVG, a, a separate one that's also referencing some things. Um, I had, oh yeah. So let me clear this and just, you know, do this. And I don't know, something like this. So the practicality of this particular example is um, debatable, <laughs> but um, I think this is a really fun one to show. Um, once you start thinking about your closure data, like it, it being just values and um, different ways that you might interact with those values, you can come up with some interesting controls that you can build. Uh, I'll briefly say that HTMX was a key in helping me kind of iterate and come up with these little things quickly. And the reason for that is um, since HTMX just sends HTML fragments to your front end, um, if you can create web components that encapsulate a little bit of interactivity, you can very easily use your back end to do some dispatch, do a little bit of logic on your closure values, and then just emit a different, basically just a different tag for a different web component. And that's how I'm working on this a little bit. So let me um, zoom in on this draw canvas to kind of explain what I mean. So here, I've just got a closure map and I've got a key control and then I've got drawing canvas. And then in here, I've got a whole bunch of points. Now these points change I don't have to write them out manually. If I clear this and flip back to my value, the points uh, vector is empty. And if I go once again to the control and I go back, as you, as you might guess, then it puts in values there. Um, so in the back end, I'm dispatching um, the control component on this key here, control drawing canvas. And then I get a nice canvas out of it. 
Um, there's another demo I've got lined up that shows another um, drawing example, uh, but that's that, that that isn't really how it works. I'm just showing you what it is. Uh, how it works is a little more involved there. There's a little bit of JavaScript and a little bit of logic on the closure backend, but HTMX facilitates sending this the um, the fragment just nice and quick. Um, and and this is what I mean. If you let me let me gather my thoughts just for a second here. Um, the cell itself is just a closure map. And inside it is just a vector of 2D. Uh, I call them points, but they're just they're just closure vectors that contain two numbers. It, it's just a value. There's nothing particularly magical about it. If your web component can take some interactivity and produce a data structure that looks like what you want it to, 2D points, you can you can just send the data to the back, do whatever you want with it, interact with it on the front end. It's relatively straightforward. Um, and that's been that's been a nice realization as I've been hacking on this, is if I can if I if I on the back end I know I want the data to look this way, and then I think of an interaction that can facilitate it, you kind of just have to figure out how to do a little bit of JavaScript to get what you want, and then you can go ahead. Um, let's see what else is good. So in, in this, so, um, unfortunately, one thing that you might notice is my scrolling is not great. This is, um, this is a downside of how I'm doing things with HTMX. Let me go on a tangent for a moment here. HTMX and the creator of HTMX talk about it being a really good tool for some things and not a great tool for others. And one thing I'm discovering as I work on this spreadsheet is some of the limitations of kind of sending everything to the back end. Um, this is an implementation detail on my part that I, I truly think I can arch architect it a little bit better. But the reason it's a little sluggish when I do a scroll is because um, I'm shifting the camera by one cell location, and then I'm re-rendering all of the cells that are visible. And so if you have a lot of visible cells in the area, you're going through and you're re-rendering quite a few things. So what would make a little more sense perhaps is to, on the front end only, handle some of that dynamic, you know, moving things around and then synchronize your state in a more clever way at a stable time to the back end. So this this is an area where I'm still thinking of ways to improve things and um, there's work to be done. Nevertheless, um, before I didn't have the ability to move outside of the, the window at all. So, you know, still steps in the right direction, in my opinion. Um, Let's see, what else would be cool to show here? Oh, um, do I use a lib to handle dependency and reevaluation? Seems like Javelin would be great for this. Um, this, so I'm using, oh boy. <laughs> um, for all the reevaluation, and oh my goodness, I didn't expect that to happen. All of the reevaluation and things like that lives in um, my cells namespace. And I, I think I mentioned it. I have currently three different versions that I'm hacking around. The first one, um, I had found someone else's implementation using uh, atoms and priority maps. And I didn't fully understand it. So I figured maybe I'll try to implement something myself um, to understand a little bit better. So the second version I came up with was a core async version where it used an event bus and every cell was basically its own little agent and it would listen for all of its inputs and it would just broadcast onto the event bus its own outputs. Now, the problem with that is not 
the well it is the implementation the problem with that is my lack of understanding of how it works so i put together something i thought would work and i was running into problems where messages were being missed or delayed and i need to learn more <laughs> the third implementation uses missionary and uh, that's another thing that I don't fully understand, but it does get me, um, you know, like I'm not missing updates or anything like that. Point with all of this is, is uh, you're totally right that there's probably something that exists that will handle this properly. What I like about the fact that I came up with my own implementations is now I know the semantics of what I need for a cell to work the way I want it. So I can build a test suite to you know, guarantee what I need. And now I know a little bit more about what might actually be happening in those libraries that I go to in the near future. Um, yeah, that's that's one nice <laughs> benefit of keeping bad at the front of the <laughs> front of the, uh, the project. Um, maybe can I ask a related question? And maybe, yeah. maybe it belongs to a different part of the talk. So. Uh, oh, I'm Daniel, sorry. Um, uh, we have a REPL, uh, I mean, sorry, yeah? we have a JVM process running in your machine. We could mm -hmm. have a REPL communicating with that process. And I'm wondering, can we introspect the whole thing from the REPL? And can we possibly generate the whole thing from the REPL? Mm. Uh, I mean, a whole state of a spreadsheet right yes so um great question let me um you know since we're since we're um, i'm off the cuff now it's it's all free form let me show you um the the REPL i have right now oh, up here sorry thanks pardon me uh, possibly we need a bigger font Oh yeah, I'll uh, I'll I'll zoom it in. Thanks. Okay. So on the left here, I've just got my my main, and I've got. Um, I'm running bad spreadsheet in this REPL here, so. Um, If I, so I happen to know where the different state objects live. If I do um, C global cells, um, it's a big old mess, but all of the cells live in the cell state. Um, all of the entities that are the, like the spreadsheet cells that you see on the front end are in um, this, the sheet state here. Um, and basically the, um, the contents of the cells live in these, in the entities key. And then each entity is, a, it, it's a map uh, of its ID to its various content elements. So the content of cell seven is 25 and um actually i'm gonna um for just a minute here i'm gonna uh clear out the sheet and do a blank one and um show you an example of how you can from the REPL modify what's going on and see the changes on um the sheet itself because that's that's related a little bit to to your question i think yeah thank you yeah so let me do um, main should clear it. Okay. So we are in no man's land. We've got an empty um, spreadsheet. Oh, by the way, I, I forgot to I, I forgot to mention this, but if you um, look here, well, I zoomed in too much. <laughs> uh, here. There we go. 
this here is a little um, palette of buttons and stuff that I want to add to over time. But what you have here is the origin. So this is the zero zero position. And you can use this button here to um, add a waypoint at a corner at any arbitrary location. And so if you click it, it'll center your screen on that point. So if you ever get lost or if I'm ever messing around incorrectly, I can just click the origin and then pop back there. Um, so that's what I'll use as a quick way to get back to zero. Uh, right, so we've got an empty spreadsheet. I'm going to create a new cell here and I'm just gonna leave the contents blank. It's not actually blank, but it says blank. Now, if I have a look at the state, there's a couple things in here. The size is the, the grid size, which we won't worry about. Active, there's currently no cells active, although there should be. Huh. Oh no, I, I, I was mistaken. That's the zero ID. So the active cell is currently cell zero. That's all that means. Uh, camera location is, um, that's this corner. The top left corner is, is at this cell location cursor location and the cursor size. And then right now I just have a single entity and the content is this string. So if I want to change that, I can uh, create, let's see, swap. Let's do a function that takes the state and then I do social uh, let's see, entities, zero, content, um, not blank. Sorry for, for my current lack of creativity. Oops, I did something wrong here. My goodness, okay. My, what am I failing to do here? I'm just oh, not argument as doing a such in state, I guess. Oh. Sorry, everyone. Yes. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm getting the live demo nerves. <laughs> you, you have to oh, put yeah, state yeah. after I look in. Um, Swap state. It's got to be like this, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so thank you. Sorry, everyone. Um, so I've, I've updated the, the state of the sheet itself, but, um, you know, it hasn't reflected itself here. What I have to do, um, what do I have to do? Hmm. Sorry, everyone. Let me try to remember. Ah, uh, okay. So I think I've just run into another example of an area for architectural improvement. I did um, just gloss over it before. I have um, a state atom in the spreadsheet, which controls the UI related elements of the cell itself. And I have a cells state atom as well. So this is two bits of state. And as you can see, like I was just, I already forgot what I had to do. So I've got state in one spot and in a second spot. And, you know, when I'm using the app properly, both of them get nicely synchronized. But in order to um, create the state of the spreadsheet from the REPL, now I have to know those implementation details. And so it's not that it can be done, it's that perhaps the way I've architected where the state's saved needs to be updated itself. Does that make sense? Uh, if I, you know, um, try again, we've got the content that's not blank, but nothing is updated. The form itself is still blank. Uh, the cell itself still has the old data. 
So I have to I have to do it from another mechanism. So I can't operate on state directly. If you give me just a moment, I can have a look at. Um, I instead look at the code handler for when um, when I make a code change from the UI, it dispatches something to the back end and it gets a string. And it ends up running through the handle entity here. And so what's happening here is you know the proper state update. So let me try to mimic that. And then that might get me closer to what I want. So I guess to, to short circuit the answer to your question, um, not yet. <laughs> you can't fully create a cell or a spreadsheet state from within the REPL, at least not in a user-friendly way. This is something on my backlog of things to improve. I mean, I have a mechanism that does load a spreadsheet state from an Eden file. So it's partially there, but room to improve. Uh, in a minute, I will show there is a different way that you can kind of push stuff into the sheet, which is not the same, but it is kind of useful. Um, let me just gather my thoughts for a quick second here and um, then, okay. Me do okay. I do find your code is. Okay, I am going to um, bail <laughs> on that and I'll, I'll, I'll shift gears. It's very clear that even though there are ways to do this, even to myself, it's not it's not intuitive enough, and is therefore <laughs> some area that I I, I think I should um, improve on. The loading mechanism does work from an Eden file, like I said. I think for myself, that's that, and um, making sure the state is in a a sane single location. Those two things will be kind of the keys to getting to. Um, REPL friendly spreadsheet. Um, there is I was instead. Say, Adam, that you know these moments where we get to see you thinking, actually, actually diving in. That's so inspiring, and that's what we love to do in this group. So, and yeah, and we have lots of time. So, really, much appreciated. Thank you for this diving. Okay. That, that's great. Um, you know, I uh, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. I I do. I love the questions, and it it's like. It's humbling to recognize, oh man, I thought I knew the answer or like I built this thing and I can't show you that, but that's that's great. And it is indeed, you know, what part of the process here, you know, I'm, I'm iterating towards a good spreadsheet. That's the goal. <laughs> um, okay, let me, th this is, this is now that, now that this is on my mind, let me share a slightly different way that you can, from the REPL, push values into your sheet. And the way that that can be done is with something here like send value. Um, let me get back into this and do target cell ID value. Hmm. 
I sorry, let me see if I did I break something? No, things seem to be working. Okay. All right, let me let me send a value. That uses um a target and a value. And what this is is actually a little bit of um an escape hatch to the way I've implemented things. I'm gonna um change what's in here to uh, div with um, my target. So this is an empty div with the ID my target. And the value is rendered as it's empty. Like it's rendering the div, but there's nothing in there. Now, if I go here, what I can do is send a value to the target which was my target. And I'm gonna make a paragraph that says hi. And then there we go. We can see that it gets um, placed right in there. So this, what do I mean by it's a bit of sort of a, a sidestep and escape hatch? This is using HTMX pretty much directly. So what, what um, this broadcast content into does is just send an HTML fragment over a WebSocket. And HTMX on the front end looks at any of that content and matches the IDs with an ID in the DOM and just chucks it in there. So if you wanted to be producing something in the REPL, you didn't want to be messing around with the um, content in the spreadsheet itself, but you wanted to visualize it quickly. So let's suppose I've got, um, here I, I have, um, I, I've, I've loaded my SVG namespace into here and this is a circle. Okay, that's nice, but what does that look like? Let's imagine I don't know what a circle of radius 20 looks like. I can broadcast into my target um, SVG, 20, and you can see it changed right there. Uh, let's do 120. Oops. That's, um, let's move it like that. There we go. Oops. What have I done? There we go. So, um, you can use you can use the REPL to, to kind of spit stuff out into the front end there, and um, I, I've been I was kind of going quickly, but it's it'll render um, any hiccup you've got, and if on the front end you have loaded in some kind of web component thing, it'll load that in there. So I could um, I'm not sure what'll happen. It shouldn't really work properly, but I could do. Um, a drawing canvas in there oh, it does something. So there we go. This is the drawing canvas component I had from earlier. Okay, I don't want that anymore. Let's put the circle back. There you go. So it is not creating the state, but it is broadcasting visual elements, um, which I think you know has some utility on its own. Um, it, it's hard to show in a Zoom call, but. The way I like to work on this is I've got my um, Emacs on one monitor and then I've got bad spreadsheet on another. And if you have a nice big monitor, you can make, you know, one, two, three different cells and you can just you be you can be broadcasting values to them as just buckets for visualizers. Um, you can broadcast to them and you can still make little sliders in your actual spreadsheet and you know, you, you can combine, you can basically construct a workflow as you're going is what I'm trying to get at. So that send values thing is not exactly what you were asking, but it's a pretty cool tool on its own. Um, yeah, so that, uh, I think that's kind of interesting. I, I, I liked that when I came up with how to do that. Um, I have one other sort of, half cooked demo um, that I'd like to show just because it it illustrates a little bit of um, what 
I personally like to do with this sort of thing. And I'll, I'll load that up. Does, does someone have another question? Yeah, I have a very quick question. Uh, I see the yeah. loading of the content in the cells is, uh, is happening without like a flickering of the content inside it. Uh, sometimes when I'm doing swaps uh, with uh, like Vega charts, they like leave and come back like very quickly, but like I can see it. Mm -hmm. So is that some setting in HTML where you can tell, oh, wait for the complete response until you swap the content or are you morphing it in? Uh, mm. like, yeah. So I have um, tried... So with HDMX, there's some plugins, um, MorphDOM and Idiomorph. I forget which one. I've tried both uh, to prevent flickering and in particular to prevent losing focus. If you're swapping in a different part of your DOM and you're in like a text element, it can lose focus and that's a pain. That might be related to what you're describing, but if I had to make a guess, if it's something like a chart, probably what's happening is you're getting data and then the JavaScript side of things is doing something with that data and reloading that part of your DOM. So it might be, um, it, it might not be the swap part. It might be the JavaScript part and how that particular component works. I, I don't know that for sure. Go ahead. Yeah, uh yeah, yeah, I was saying I think you're like right, uh, right on this one because when I tried high charts, it was not doing anything like flickery with the swaps. It was animating it. So like mm -hmm. I did not have a concrete answer to it. But now like you're mentioning it, and I'm I'm going back in my head, and it's probably the the JavaScript too. So I might need to look into what Vega does for like updating the charts. And experiment more mm -hmm. with like the morphing and the high charts. Yeah, thank you for like doubling down on what I thought was the problem. Yeah, it, it's um, it is another um, area where um, HTML's simplicity. Well, maybe that's not fair to say. In my opinion, this is an area where you sometimes end up with a bit of a sharp edge. Where, I mean, the promise is, oh, all I have to do is send this little thing over. And then it puts in a chart and it does, but you get a flicker and you have to know, is it related to the, the library on the JavaScript side? Is it something else? It's not exactly obvious what happened. Yeah. Where, yeah. where yeah, it comes into happening. play. Yeah. But in fairness to HTMX, what I'm sending back is just a script element. And then I'm having the JavaScript library on the front end do the rendering. So maybe if I did the mm -hmm. rendering with the JavaScript in the back end somehow magically, because I have no idea how to even do that, and then send the complete result to the front end, then the flicker won't happen because it will be an, an instantaneous replacement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd give that or something along those lines a try. That seems probable. Um, yeah. Yeah, in my experience, there I tried one. Um, I had a 3D model web component library that I tried, and I could send the the DOM elements from HTMX into the in, into my front end just fine, and um, it would it it would reload. Like you could see the element, and it would just refresh and restart like the the model every time you sent data so i i think it's very likely that it's a little bit javascript dependent there are probably ways around it but um it's not necessarily trivial uh sorry to say i wish it were <laughs> um let me load in this last little um so maybe let us for a moment let us stop and think we have half an hour and maybe it makes sense for you adam to keep demonstrating whatever you find right for like 15 minutes or 20 minutes. And then we'll have some time where we try to encourage other voices to say something of their experience. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, great. Thanks. Well, you know, I, so I'll, I'll just look this last thing. And, and I'd say, um, let's just encourage the talking right now. And um, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll listen and, and I'll, mess around and, and you know load up these things as we go. I think I think more questions, more discussion at this point would be great.
Yeah. So let us try something. And yeah, of course, maybe there are questions, but maybe maybe let us try to encourage something. So maybe uh, let us uh, allow Adam to rest for some time and, <laughs> and like for a few minutes. And maybe, maybe since a few people are, are here, are doing something with HTMX, trying to build something, have already had experience, maybe we can chat about it for a while. Like if anybody has a story to tell for like one or two minutes of what you have done, what you're curious about, then we can spend a few minutes doing that. I think that Ham, you have some things to tell if that, if you have it, right? But maybe let us first ask if there is any other person here who hasn't talked yet, who may wish to tell something of their experience, any related experience. Yeah, maybe let us begin with that hum because I think you you're doing a few things which are very much related, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm very much. I'm, uh, I'll make it uh, short. So. Uh, I'm trying to build a solution that mimics what R has in the form of Shiny. Shiny is this uh, uh, amazing project over there at the, in the R land where you can basically create an interactive dashboard through the definition of inputs and outputs. And you basically, like the syntax is, is very minimal. You're like, you basically say, hey, I want an input that's a slider that has its values coming from this data set. And it would render you that, that input. And then you would say, hey, I want this output to interact with this input such that when the input changes the values, like it selects a different, uh, it selects a different output, like for example, from a, like for example, a, uh, a world phones, uh, data set it would select by the year and it would show you the number of phones in a different uh, like over the years and i'm trying to implement this in uh, closure and using htmx for the front end uh, i'm like it's still very much in like early stages we're talking about uh, me danielle and the other people at like at the real world data group and the visual tools groups uh, we're talking about how like how to write like even the syntax we're discussing it we're, we're, we're discussing like for example how the to link the inputs and outputs uh, i had uh, talks with uh, kyle uh, yesterday, like very fruitful discussions, we were talking about, for example, uh, how R knows what you what you mean when you tell it, hey, this input, and it infers the, like, for example, the row names, or it, it infers what column you, you're trying to select. And sometimes uh, we were talking also about, like, the, the kind of symbols we're going to generate. For example, in HTMX, we're trying to target something specific. So if I'm creating an arbitrary number of inputs, I would need to generate the symbols for those inputs and, and link them. And so there's like this, how do I place the inputs and outputs and use the same data set on the input side and the output side? It's a very interesting project and try to figure out the architecture of the R things and bring them to closure and hopefully introduce uh, a, a way of building dashboards and closure that does not involve you writing many, many API endpoints, and you can just write your inputs, declare your outputs, process your data, and see visual things. Thank you so much for this, Adham. And yeah, surely we'll talk more about it. And, and maybe, um, Mark, would you like to briefly tell your story? Um, sure, yeah. So um, <clears throat> I've just kind of been experimenting with, I guess, uh, HTMX. Uh, Personally, then I guess professionally a little bit recently over the past maybe year or so, I've got a tool that I've been working on called, it's called Keg Party. The idea is it's a, it's a, a like a party tap server. Um, and I, I, the original intent was you can tap your, you, know, you can tap from your various REPLs and stuff and it shows up there so you can kind of collaborate. I've never actually gotten around to like the party part. I mean, theoretically it works, but it's HTMX with WebSockets. And um, I, I found it to be <clears throat> extremely pleasant to work with HTMX. I could actually, I don't know if people want, I could, I could give like a super short demo now, or I could talk about it like at our next meeting or something. But um, anyways, the, but the idea is it's a front end where you have a tap stream 
of all your data. You can change channels. You can send your, you know, you send all your tap data around. You can drill into all your tap data, and um, it's all HTMX. There's no front end. There's like a tiny bit of JavaScript just for a couple of effects, but almost none. Um, my overall experience with HTMX has been, and, and I've seen this like recently. I, I can't talk to it super specifically, but if you have a um, a widget you're trying to do like with traditional like React or Reframe or whatever versus doing an HTMX, I think your time to develop the HTMX component and fully implement everything and test it is going to be substantially lower because it is a far less complicated paradigm than having even even if like Reframe is super well designed, the idea that you've got like a view, you've got that since you've got MVC, you've got a view, you've got a model, you've got all these things. Um, it's just a lot of complexity. You've got to maintain synchronized front and back end state. HTMX makes a lot of those problems go away. So, thank you so much. And yes, let us talk and make it <clears throat> actually bring it to possibly the next meeting if that is okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Sir. I can drop a little link. Let me draw. I'll drop two links here. If you want to try out my little uh, tap server thing, there's one link, and I can. I'd be happy to talk about that at the next meeting. I've got another project. This is just sort of me messing around. It's called CLJ HTMX Playground. Um, and uh, this one here, I could fire it up right now. It, I, I have commits that are not not pushed, but this is just me like trying to understand how HTMX works. And in fact, if anyone else wants to like throw some pull requests against this, um, that'd be totally cool. But um, uh, I, could, I could even fire this up right now and show it if people want. But basically, it's just um, it's just like, Here's how to do a button, but then I've also got some much more interesting items like a workflow and like a, how to build a calendar and all that. Some of these again aren't committed, but I could talk about this right now or either one later. Just let me know. Yeah. So possibly later or next time would be. Perfect. That'd be great. Wonderful. And yeah. So I guess maybe uh, possibly Chuck has something to comment about and then we'll move back to Adam's presentation and maybe in the discussion part afterwards we can chat more if Adam and Mark can stay then we can chat more about what you discussed and so Chuck would you like to try to use your voice or should I read maybe uh, your comment which one is better oh. oh it's good we are trying but yeah we cannot hear you yeah, so I'll, I'll read uh, Chuck's comment. So Chuck did want to say, if you are interested in formal prior art on the incremental computation, there is also adapt on, and there is a link to the PDF, and mini adapt on, which has a closure implementation. Oh, thank you for opening that. And yeah, and... Yeah, so I'll share all these links in the in the summary of the meeting. Oh, wonderful to know about it. Yeah, yeah. So all these comments was uh, a little time for Adam to rest, and now we go back to Adam's presentation and discuss these more later. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, let's see here. Um, I need, unfortunately. Just another second to figure out why I had, you know, the classic, you know, works works before you go, and then <laughs> yeah, isn't working. It's always like that, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe I could use this lull just to encourage you. Uh, this is very cool. Thanks, I appreciate that. Um, it's it's nice to hear. Like, I can um work on this and, and make, you know, my own little designs and, and hack things around and feel like it's cool on my own, but it is nice to be able to show other people and have interest in, in that way as well. And, you know, eventually get it to a state where other people feel like it's cool to use as well. That would be nice. So uh, when you were drawing and then having those points sent to the server side and then returning an SVG that was a calculation based on that. Um, I know you're just trying mm -hmm. to show the round trip, but and you're saying it was arguable. Um, but actually, I want to settle that and say that it's actually useful in its own right because it made me think immediately of the idea of like using generative art at Quill 
Mm -hmm. But like one of the tricky things about generative art is finding a good seed. Like, oh, you can find a mm -hmm. bit of code that like can give you a good generative art output. But where do you seed it? Like what like what initial inputs? And so being able to like really quickly randomize the stuff just by drawing a you know drawing a set of points or whatever like just having some way of coming up with random data by the way you draw and then sending that into the generative art and then getting back what it generates you could create a fairly mm -hmm. interesting workflow for testing those type of things absolutely and i mean like you you sniffed out one of the things i like to do with this um <laughs> i have an axi draw <laughs> sitting in the in the corner there and i like to do like SVG is really good for, um, you know, line work and, and generative art is exactly, it's right up my alley. And uh, a vision I have is, yeah, you get some like form that creates some SVG and, or, or whatever. And uh, you do want to automate it, right? Like you don't, like, I don't want to have to specify the inputs but I want to know what kinds of inputs look good and what kinds look bad. So if you make an array of cells that like vary certain factors automatically, you could then like look at them all, click this one, say more like this, please. And, and what have you. And yeah, it, I think there's a lot of potential there and every generative art project you have is going to be slightly different. Right. And so the, the 2d canvas of cells is really conducive to, uh, let me just slap that there. Let me throw that there. Oh, well, let's just quickly try this. And and you get this sort of um, piecemeal <laughs> tool that you can, you know, in, in the perfect vision of this tool is like, okay, you draw a little line around, okay, these final inputs and these outputs are what I want to make. Like this this set of cells is the final thing that I want to use if I want to make more of these generative art pieces in the future. So you make this big messy canvas, you sweep it together into a nice little mini app at the end, boom, publish. That's the dream. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, you're taking it to the next level. I love that. Yeah, that's so cool. Um, yeah. Because one of the things that's interesting about generative art is just that when you found a point in the space, it is reproducible. As long as you provide all the data, anybody else could view that as well, mm -hmm. not just like a rastered image of it, but like actually have it generate on their end. Um, so yeah, I love that you're mm -hmm. saying, okay, this is how you would share it too. Mm -hmm. That's that's very cool. That's that's a dream, uh, for sure a dream one day uh, of this. Let, let me, sorry, I'm, I'm still distracting myself here trying to get this last thing working the way I want. Okay, this might be, this might be what I'm looking for. Nope, that's the wrong one. Well, I, I, you know, I'd say let's keep chatting. I'm not sure I'll be able to to rescue this right now. Sorry to say. Yeah. The, the other demo I had going, but uh, I'd be happy to keep chatting a little bit. Wonderful. And um, yeah, and, uh, you know, we can always meet in the future when you find it right. It is so inspiring so far and yeah can we ask if anybody else wishes to say or ask anything now if you visual visual tool people hear many ui minded people so possibly another voice wishes to say something um one kind of crazy idea i had was just that i i think i see why having the browser render things for you is like a really powerful way to do this. And so HTMX makes it really easy, easy to ship additional markup to the browser and just have the browser uh, update the display. Um, but on the subject of having a vowel and you're like, oh, it's just running locally. Do we need the backend to be running in a separate process or would it be possible to like embed some closure script in the page, but then instead of that code being, um, you know, instead of that code manipulating the DOM directly, just have that code output markup like it would have and just have HTMX fetch it 
from some, some sort of call internally in the page. I, I, don't, I don't know if there's any easy way to make that call back to something that's inside the page. Uh, I've, but basically I've, keep the whole rendering stack that you have, but just have the code run locally when that's all you need. Mm -hmm. I, I've had that exact thought and I think you probably could make it work um, somehow. Like as far as HTMX is concerned, it sends basically an Ajax or like a fetch to some endpoint. And if that endpoint responds, then it does whatever it wants. If you can figure out how to get that endpoint just be from the same like JavaScript process that you maybe wrote up in Closure Script, who knows? Then I think you could make it work. Um, that would be like, like I said, I want to, you know, highlight a bunch of cells, you know, and click publish or whatever. Something along those lines would be theoretically what you'd want. Um, you know, you'd run into probably some concerns related to, you know, if you're using a JVM heavy process to actually do your work. I mean, what's going to happen if you want to do a closure script side only thing? It won't work. But for those cases where you could do it all in Clojure Script, there's got to be a way. <laughs> and that would be pretty cool. Too. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, you can't do Java interrupt and then ship that in, in a self-contained browser thing. Um, well, I'll circle back around to that because that even that's not necessarily off the table. But the, So mm -hmm. uh, one thing to look at is Stack Blitz. Um, Stack Blitz is Node running in your browser. It's built on top of uh, a Wasm um, container. They the people that make Stack Blitz call it web containers. So it's Wasm, but then with their special sauce added on top. I don't think that's open source, unfortunately. Um, but the but web containers are something that you can use in your own projects, I think. So it's Stack Blitz is an example of using a web container. Um, <clears throat> but I think you could embed your own web container um, in your project. And uh, so you could use that as the substrate for having something that it emits closure script and then run it in that environment and that can output HTML. Like however they're doing stack blitz, you, not only can you edit the page, but you can see what, what, like not only can you edit the stuff that would be running inside of node and it's all running inside your browser, you can mm -hmm. see what the rendered content would look like as, as you're editing it. So it's sort of like a self-contained mm -hmm. node development environment with it rendering to the same browser like in a, hmm. a, a, a subset of that browser's uh, page. Um, so def they've definitely figured out how to transmit that data back into the page, whatever's being rendered on the, the node backend, so to speak. But that right. node backend is running inside that browser um, in a WASM uh, container uh, is my understanding. Uh, so. So there's probably some way to leverage that. Um, it might be overkill though, if it was just Closure Script, because maybe you could just run the Closure Script in the browser as as JavaScript and and just fetch that stuff like it. Um, but it, right. but if you needed to reach for other Node like modules and stuff, you could then potentially run all of that stuff in the browser uh, and and script it all up with Closure Script. Um, mm -hmm. And 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 just another way to glue it all together is, is that there's a there's a framework called Sitebox that um, is uh, meant to allow you to make Closure Script uh, with Node as the the underlying um, development platform instead of the JVM. But it's 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 basically a web framework on top of Node for Closure Script. Hmm. Um, the keywords I've written down, Stack Blitz, Sitebox, those, those are good Googling terms. Is that correct? 
Yeah, uh, stackblitz.com, I think, is the that one. And then Sitefox, uh, you can find... Oh, Sitefox. A, uh, a, yeah, Sitefox. And that one, um, I believe there was a presentation done for London Closurians uh, that he, where he goes over the basic idea of what Sitefox is. Yeah, wonderful. So, Tim, I propose, uh, if you wish, you could share those links in the chat or afterwards, I can add them to the summary. And just because we have a few more minutes, I think it makes sense to read Chuck's comment, which is kind of related mm -hmm. to things we hope to discuss. Uh, or maybe, Adam, you had a comment uh, about it. I didn't want to kind of stop you too. To, no. Uh, Oh, yeah, so maybe I'll read Chuck's uh, comment, which is kind of related to a few things, and then we can kind of uh, conclude and then have some time to discuss for those who can stay. And yeah, thank you. So Chuck says, um, uh, Chuck has, uh, has an HTMX project uh, that Chuck has been working on, uh, which is a simpler version of what Adam and Adam uh, have been working on, where uh, the evaluation is done at uh, SCI context, which means small closure interpreter, with all the cyclog, the main cyclog uh, data science dependencies. Oh, thank you, Tim. Uh, and so, so Chuck's focus has been creating some platform that connects to the typical data science dependencies, and and using some of our more, uh, you know regular tools like clay for static rendering, Chuck has started exploring something dynamic, dashboard-like, if I understand correctly, over our usual static notebook systems. And I think it is, for a few of us, it, in, it is an important direction because typically we have some static data visualization, just creating a static HTML page to, you know, some report of an analysis or a plot we've created. Our usual workflow may be just about creating HTML. And then sometimes there is a need to progress and make it dynamic. And I think that is what Chuck is exploring. And we'd love to explore more about, you know, how we could take a typical data science report and just push it possibly into one of these many dashboard-like tools. So thank you for this, Chuck. And uh, surely we'll talk more about it um, and we have seven minutes now, and so maybe we should use them mostly if Adam, you wish to conclude somehow or add anything you hope to, to say for the recorded part, and then otherwise we have more time to chat and discuss. Um, I'd just like to uh, say thank you, Daniel, for inviting me to, to talk about this, and thank you, everyone who is interested in listening and your questions and comments. Thank you for bearing with the uh, little lulls and the imperfections here and there. Um, I appreciate the patience. Um, and I just, um, I guess I want to encourage everyone to um, just, uh, you know, have fun when you're building the things you're building and, um, keep uh, well, I don't want to don't, I'm not trying to I don't want to preach I just I just hope everyone enjoys working with visual tools and has fun when they're building them and um, can keep in mind that computers are really useful and powerful and as much as we can we should make tools that empower people to be creative to uh, visualize what they want to touch the things that they're working on and, and that's the philosophy and desire that I have as I keep working on stuff like this. Um, and thanks everyone for your time and your interest. I really appreciate it. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, so inspiring, Adam, really so much appreciate. And I see, uh, you know, all the comments uh, excited about what you have showed, shown today. And so, um, Maybe it is time to say goodbye to the recorded part, unless there is any other comment. And we'll say goodbye to our listeners and see you on the next times.